What's going on, guys? And welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to give you the entire blueprint, the entire guidebook on reading and using the Keepa tool. Right? Keepa is going to be the most foundational, the most essential tool when it comes to growing and scaling a profitable Amazon business. It fills in all the gaps when it comes to evaluating if a product is profitable, evaluating if a product is moves, evaluating if we're going to get potentially in trouble or have account, ish or account health issues when we are looking to sell a product. Right? But we also have to understand what to look for when we're looking and using the Keepa tool. Right? So in this video, we're going to walk through every step of the way, how to use Keepa, all the different aspects that it presents us to make informed and accurate and profitable product sourcing decisions. The way I like to kind of break it down for newer sellers when we're talking about Keepa is kind of like a three-step process equation. Skewing factors, velocity, and profit, right? And in my mind, the reason why it's important and the most efficient and most productive to start with what I call skewing factors is because it's the easiest and quickest way to disqualify products, right? And if you've followed me for any bit of time, any length of time, you know I talk a lot about disqualifying bad products early, right? If we can say no to 100 products, well, we can get to that 101st product that's potentially profitable that much quicker. And really the differentiation between a veteran Amazon seller and a beginning Amazon seller is the ease at which you say no to products. Again, because it's such a volume game for a lot of this, because it's such a volume game, we have to get through the bad products. We have to get through the fluff as quick as possible to uncover that next winning product. And when we talk about skewing factors, Keepa is going to really pinpoint where and when we should potentially skip a product right off the bat but without having to get into velocity equation, without having to get into profitability, without having to get into any other, any other things. The skewing factors really allow us to skip over products quickly that make no sense and have no chance at being a productive product in our business, right? And so we have a couple examples. First and foremost, we'll look at this weighted vest. Now, it may be profitable. Who knows? We don't necessarily care because I'm going to show you why it doesn't matter, right? Say, for example, we can buy this at $39.99, right? Profitable. However, we have to go through our process. And, and again, the process is going to become very clear as we get through this video. First thing we want to do anytime we look at a product is understand whether or not the brand itself is on the product. Now, a lot of times it's pretty apparent if we look at the offer count and see only one seller on the product. In this case, right, we see one seller for most of the time. This blue line down here is the offer count. It's going to give us a historical trajectory of the amount of sellers or offers on a particular product. Now, in this case, we see there's one offer for most of the last three months. And if we span back, there's one offer for pretty much the entire past year. Now, that's a red flag. Anytime you see a product with only one seller, and it, even if it's one, two, or three sellers, you should be, you know, your spidey senses should go off. It's, you should be concerned, right? And the easiest way to identify, if we can go into the buy box, we go into buy box, buy box statistics, and sure enough, we're going to see this zealous direct as the only seller in the buy box. Now, that correlates with, you know, no oscillation as we will get into later in this, in this video. However, but as a very general rule of thumb, if you, if you ever come across a product of one or two sellers, regardless of if it's Amazon or not, there is cause for concern, and this is something that we have to skip over. Now, in terms of saving time, that's something that we have to start with because if we end up doing the due diligence so we find a source and we can buy this, for example, for maybe 30, well, I guess not 30, maybe like 20 or something, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't make sense to go look for a source or go look for profitability, go look for a discount code to make this profitable because at the end, we're going to come back to the same unanimous truth mean, or being we can't simply sell this product. And so again, general rule of thumb, start with the main and, and first disqualifying, disqualifying factor of is the brand on the product or not, right? That's step number one. Now two, similar to what we were just talking about, we want to understand if Amazon is on the product and they are not sharing the buy box. Now, this is also pretty apparent once we start to understand what to look for. Now, in general, when we see orange on a keeper chart, that means Amazon's in the equation. That means Amazon's on the product, selling the product. Now, there's going to be a, a lot of different shapes and sizes of, of competing with and potentially winning with Amazon on the product. But again, as another general rule of thumb... Anytime we see Amazon on the product and there's no real buy box oscillation, another cause for concern, 
right? Because what this tells me is that yes, Amazon's on the on the product. Granted, some listings, as we'll talk about later in the video, we will actually be able to win alongside Amazon on a product. But in this case, this is something that Amazon is clearly not sharing the buy box. There's clearly no offer count oscillation, so no people coming in and out of the listing. And so this is going to be something that we're going to be skipping off right off the bat, right? And so be on the lookout anytime you see a lot of orange on a, on a keeper chart. Be on the lookout and understand that Amazon's in the picture. But more importantly than Amazon being in the picture or not, we want to understand if Amazon is sharing the buy box and if sellers are kind of going in and out of stock. And in this case, none of which are happening. And so again, this is another skip. Does it matter if we go hunt this down and it's $15 profit per unit or whatever the case may be, right? That's all great and good. However, the, the, the similar to the last example we used, it is an overwhelming truth. It is a trump card to play when a product has one or two sellers on it and or Amazon's on the listing, right? So we covered that. The third and, 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 le and, and final, call it skewing factor, disqualifying factor is... IP alerts, right? And so IP complaints, IP issues, account health issues come when a brand is is not necessarily on the product, but they're monitoring the product. And so in this case, right, this is some, you know, fruit and veggies, supplements or whatever the case may be, right? We don't necessarily see the brand on this particular product as suggested by, you know, the 70, 60, 50 sellers on this particular product. This is an arbitrageable product. Right, we can probably buy this for whatever it is, thirty, forty, fifty dollars, whatever, whatever the case. I guess not, or maybe twenty six. But regardless of how profitable it is, we want to understand and we want to be on the lookout of any listings where the brand is monitoring the listing and they're actively kicking people off that don't belong. Right, so you're going to come across some, you know, brands in your Amazon career that have a restricted process, a process policy of who sells on their Amazon listings. And so in this case, right. They probably have a couple exclusive sellers that do their work for them on Amazon and they're monitoring the listing or they have people monitoring the listing for them and, and kind of alerting them when unauthorized sellers come on a particular listing. And that's kind of the net of an IP alert is un, unauthorized sellers get kicked off the listing. And the reason why I bring up this listing is we can see several different scenarios where there's sort of like that vertical line you see, right? It happens once in early, or, um, you know, late October happens in call it mid January early January happen again before May happen again before June right anytime you see these vertical lines going down that means people are getting kicked off the listing right and as a, another general rule of thumb anytime you see it, some of these vertical lines it's an immediate pass it's an immediate red flag because again no matter how profitable this listing is this is another trump card that 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 we have to be on the lookout for because it doesn't matter if we can make $2,000, $5,000, $10,000 on this listing. What matters is we're going to keep our account safe and, health and healthy and, and, and continue our ability to sell on Amazon's platform. Right? Our account is way more valuable than the couple thousand we could potentially make on this particular listing. And so these are always going to be a skip. Right? Third rule of thumb, anytime you see a vertical line, this is going to be an easy, easy skip. Um, and a hundred percent pass because all these people, it went from 76 offers down to like call it 14, 20. They all got IP complaints. Some of which maybe got deactivated. Some of so some of them probably didn't, but whatever the case may be, clearly it's a very arbitrage friendly product because there's a bunch of sellers on it and there's a lot of a buy box oscillation, buy box, you know, stability and inconsistency. But these vertical lines are symbolic of sellers getting booted off the listing that are unauthorized. And this is something that we have to be on the lookout for. So again, the third thing that we have to be on the lookout for, where if we do see it, it's an immediate pass. Brand on the listing, right, with only one or two sellers. Amazon on the listing with no kind of shared buy box activity. And then IP potential products such as this one that are going to result in some sort of account health issue that we just simply do not want to deal with. And so if we go back to our kind of our process sheet, skewing factors is complete. Right? We talked through the kind of the three big factors that we have to be on the lookout for anytime we're evaluating a product's potential profitability for us or not. Now I mentioned that there were a couple different scenarios if we kind of go back five or ten or five or six minutes where Amazon could be on the listing, but there's different kind of qualitative factors that kind of dictate if we can be productive alongside Amazon or not. And granted, this looks similar 
to the one we previously looked at in terms of Amazon consistently on the buy box. Now it's granted not as straight and stable and flat as the other one, but there's a very, very big difference between the one we looked at previously and this one. And that's kind of embedded in the offer count. Now, as a, just a, a minor point, Amazon, you know, the, the, the Keepa, the price tracking within Keepa is not a, a by the second tool. It's going to be a general rule of thumb that says it's tracking the price, you know, every 20 minutes or every 30 minutes or every hour, whatever the case may be. And so in this case, right, Amazon's owning a lot of the product, a lot of the buy box. However, the offer count is super important in this scenario because what's actually happening when we look at and we segment call up August 1st, October 1st. Price is moving, right? Amazon, quote unquote, it looks like Amazon's owning the buy box. However, there's people going in and out of stock consistently, right? It was at 13, it was at 12, down to 11, up to 13, 12, 10, maybe, yeah, in it sniffs 10, 10 again, right? The offers are going consistently up and down, which is counterintuitive when you look at the Keeper chart, right? And so these sorts of listings are, have way more potential than the last one, and it's simply embedded in the offer count. Right, there's a big, very big difference between Amazon completely owning the buy box 100% and no offer count oscillation compared to this, where Amazon's owning the buy box where there is offer count oscillation. There's clearly potential here. There's clearly people winning here because people are going in and out of stock. Right, if Amazon was truly owning the buy box 100% of the time and owning all the sales, we wouldn't see the offers going in and out. Right, those are contradicting points. And so, when we talk about trump cards, this is another one: offer count oscillation is going to be the single source of truth. It is going to be a very, very big indicator in terms of whether there's going to be velocity, whether offer count, whether sales are happening, whether people are moving product. Offer count, offer count, offer count is going to be the north star when we come and when we talk about velocity. Remember that. Velocity or offer count is going to be the north star when we talk about velocity because things aren't selling if offer count isn't moving. Things are not selling if people are not going out of stock. The more people are coming in stock, out of stock, offer count going up and down, well, that's very symbolic of velocity. That's very symbolic of, 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 a, of a listing that's moving and a listing that we should be interested in. All right, so that's just a, a quick distinction between the products we were looking at before where Amazon was owning 100% and this particular product where Amazon is quote-unquote owning 100%, but we know and we are now educated elsewhere. Right? So we're going to keep it moving. Right. In terms of you know continuing to work through this velocity point, we already kind of established that the offer count is going to be pretty important, and this is going to be another example of that. Right, offer count going up and down consistently, consistently people going in and out of stock. You're going to start to be able to compare and contrast a lot of these different keeper charts, a lot of these different offer counts as we as you just have experience working through and looking at products. Right, we can understand that we, it's very different. It looks qualitatively different call it this keeper chart, where it's kind of more boxy, whereas this one's constantly moving up and down. And you're going to see even more so different sorts of products that are really going up and down, right? We'll kind of go through and we'll look at a couple later. But again, use the offer count as just a general rule of thumb of, of velocity, of movement, of activity, of interesting, right? Use the offer count as an interesting very, as an interesting indicator to be able to and to understand if something's moving or not. Now, keep it does make it easy, right? It shows at the top, sort of like a bought in the past month indicator. We don't necessarily know how accurate it is, right? So you can, we can use this as a general, as a very rough guideline. Usually it goes 50 plus, then 100 plus, 200 plus, 300 plus, so yada, yada, up to 1,000, then it goes 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. So it's going to be a very broad stroke in terms of velocity. So use this as a, as a data point, right, to make your decision to, to understand relative velocity. But... Use the offer count as well as more of a relative understanding of, of whether things are happening, whether people are selling in and out of stock. And again, a lot of you guys watching this video, we're not necessarily going to even be concerned whether something's selling 5,000 or 5,500 or 2,000 or 3,000, right? Because a lot of times, especially you newer sellers, we're going to be testing five units at a time, 10 units at a time, and letting the market dictate our success on a particular product, our restocks on a product, right? A lot of you guys newer, I would only advise to buy 10 units off the bat. See how they do. If they sell fast, buy 20, buy 30, buy 40, right? Use your market data, your empirical evidence to dictate your restocks and to dictate how many you're buying. And so when you're looking at a product, all you really want to have to understand is if it's selling and you can sell some units, 
right? Because that gives you the green light to, to go ahead and kind of authorize your 10 unit test buy or 20 unit test buy or 30. As you gain experience, obviously you'll have confidence to buy 100 off the bat or 500 off the bat, or whatever that number is for you. But newer sellers, I would strongly advise to stick your, to, to test buy, you know, 10, 20, 30 units, somewhere in that range and not necessarily get too, too caught up in whether it's selling 4,000 or 2,000 or 10,000. You just want to validate that sellers are indeed selling in and out of stock because that's your green light to test it, right? And so our real iteration in the market is going to be through testing products. And when we go back to our process, our velocity checkpoint, our velocity kind of um, uh, um, guideline is really just going to be, does it sell? Are people selling or not? Are people sell going out of stock or not, right? It's not going to be, oh, I can sell 700 or 600. I can sell 70 or 60. It's going to be, can I sell 10 or 20 over the next couple of weeks or can I not, right? We're going to be testing and iterating in the market, and that's really going to be how we're going to understand velocity in the beginning, right? Obviously, as you gain experience and confidence, you're going to have that confidence and competence to order 200, 500, 800 off the bat. But in the beginning, again, we just want to understand if people are selling out, if it's selling or not. Do we have a chance at sales or do we not? Is someone owning the buy box or is someone not, right? Because to that point, we can go into the buy box and understand pretty quickly if something is is kind of rotating through the dominant seller, through sellers or not, right? We load up the buy box statistics and... In this case, right, we see a bunch of, you know, 5, 10, you know, 15 sellers rotating. I mean, it's not going to be exact, but relatively even, 26, 22, 20. I'm sure these are sellers that have been on for a while. And then we have some other sellers, 6%, 5%, 5%, 2%, and a bunch of people that are getting sales, right? These are probably that bought their, you know, tested 5, 10, 15 sales or units and then moved on to something else. Or maybe they didn't like how quickly they sold or whatever the case may be, right? These are all people that are existing in the market, and so this is something that, okay, checkbox, it sells, it's good for us to test, allows us to move on to our, our third and final piece of the puzzle, which is profit. Now, the reason why we, leave, why we you know, save, quote unquote, profit for the third, the final piece of our kind of evaluation criteria process is because, and I know I've said this a lot before on this channel, is, is profit's always going to be most malleable. Profit's always going to be a sliding scale. Profit's always going to be the, some, the, the one single factor that we have the most control over, right? Because I know if we've talked about it in other videos, but there's always discount codes and coupon codes and sales and all sorts of different things that we can potentially buy something and, and manipulate the price, manufacture a margin from 20 to 17 or 20 to 18 or 20 to 16, right? That buy cost is a sliding, is a, is a malleable in a variable in our entire piece of the pie. Right, whether it's wholesale or OA, wholesale is way easier to kind of manipulate a price that sometimes in OA. But OA, of course, has a bunch of sales, as discounted gift cards. There's no sales tax. There's FBM you can do to save money. There's in maybe an extra ten percent code, or if you message customer service, you could potentially get an extra five or ten percent off. Right, there's things we can do to get to get an OA product from twenty to fifteen, twenty to eighteen. But we save profitability for last. Because these, the, the, the account health factors and the, the velocity factors, those are just going to be a lot more sedentary factors that we can't change. Right? We, we, we can't change the fact that a, product, a brand is on the listing or not. We can't change the fact that something just simply doesn't sell. Or we can't change the fact that someone's dominating the buy box. However, we can usually change something that's maybe bought for $20 to $18. Right? So you're kind of catching what I'm putting down in terms of profits that at the very end. Granted, it's the most important, but it's also the most malleable. And so kind of to keep it rolling here, when we're talking about profitability, we want to understand a couple different things. First and foremost, where has the market been and where is the market going? Right. If we look at something like this, this is as stable as possible. Right. If we look at the past three months or so, right, and we see the buy box, you know, it's very, very consistently between 27 and 30, right? That gives us a very good idea in terms of if we join the market, where we could potentially sell at. And obviously, it goes without being said that we want to be pricing along with where the market's existing, right? So we're going to be pricing between 27-ish and 30, right? But if we use 27 as a worst case, 
Well, it's right now we know we need to be buying this for, you know, fifteen, twelve dollars, something like that. Right. We're not gonna actually get into like sourcing and, and understanding and, and finding these products. This is simply just like a keep a tutorial video. But we wanna use the historical market, the majority of the historical market, to reverse engineer where we need to be buying a particular product at. Right, we can go to the data buy box statistics and really get a sense of, of where the market's been. But we already have a good idea in terms of where that market's been because we looked at the keep it chart and we kind of identified the trajectory and the stability with our eyes. Right. And this is gonna be no surprise. We come in here. The entire market's pretty much between twenty seven and thirty over the past three months, two months, etc. Right. And so we know exactly where we're gonna be selling it at, and now we know exactly what we need to be buying at. And that's how we're gonna kind of re reverse engineer right back into our particular buy cost right and so we can obviously hit google and and understand what potential price we could be, we can be buying this product at but that's again why we save it for the end right we see maybe a, a potential 20 dollar buy cost but i know nike i can get 10 percent off and maybe there's a sale or i can ship it to myself i have no sales tax those sorts of things we can slide that variable right but we want to understand and qualify based on all the other things we've talked about first and so kind of step number one when we're talking about profit and we're talking about price point is we want to understand where the market's been, right? And this is an easy one because it's super stable. And over the past couple months, it's been between 27, 30, pretty much all day long, all week long. And that's an easy one to understand. This is similar, right? It doesn't look as stable, but when we kind of sc um, scroll out in a macro perspective, it's, it's pretty similar. Right, it's you know 28, 29, drops down shortly to 23, but they probably go out of stock and it's back up to 28, jumps up to 29, jumps up to 29, right? And in this case, most of the activity is between that like 27 or like 28 to 30 range, right? And we can validate that going to the Bob Ross statistics data. We're gonna see a lot of 27, we're gonna see a lot of 28, maybe some 29, maybe a little 20, like 30 action, right? There's actually only three sellers in here. Uh, maybe scroll out a bit. But 26, you know, 29, 27, 28, right? That's kind of what we were expecting. And that's where we would need to be pricing at, right? I'm not necessarily too scared off by the 23, the 23 here, right? The 24 here, right? Because it didn't last very long. I'm more concerned about the macro trend, the majority of the activity that's happened over the past couple months. And that's where that kind of 27, 28 price point kind of falls into play. And in this case, we have our 28, 27 ish. We know we need to be buying this for 27 or 12, $15, or probably like 13. And so that's again how this whole equation works. We establish our price point that we need to be selling at and use that to back into where we need to be buying it for. And again, using sales codes and discount codes, we can adjust that if needed. But we want to understand, again, majority tra trend uh, tendencies, trajectories, to understand where we're going to be potentially selling a product at. Again, another simple one. Very stable. Offer count's very stable. It's another good product between 44 and probably 46-ish, right? Somewhere in that range. We can validate that into the buy box statistics and really just kind of cross, or check what we've already surmised from looking at the chart. Come in here, a lot of 45s, 46, 43, 51, right? 46, 44, in that range, 45, 44, somewhere in that range. Um, now notice, here it's at 59, right? Let me refresh real quick. Now, in this case, this is actually a, a super important point, right? Because in this market, the per, the product is priced now at fifty nine ninety nine, which is actually really different than historically what it has been. And so this is one of the areas where a lot of newer sellers kind of um, lose money on, right? Is because they see the fifty nine ninety nine, they see seller amp saying that it's going to be selling for fifty nine ninety nine, but we don't have a lot of evidence. We don't have a lot of market evidence that suggests that it's going to be continued to be able to sold be sold at fifty nine ninety nine. And so here is one of the scenarios where it's like we're going to kind of trump what seller amp and what keep uh, is the current market suggesting right we're going to always put more emphasis more value in the historical market as opposed to the current market right if we go quickly into the product details it gives us kind of two data points in terms of using and identifying the the delta between the current and the historical market 
right? So if we go here, buy box current, 59.99, 90 day average, 48. 180 day 51 right so we're going to be pricing between these two as opposed to the 59 and so when we go into back into what our I'll keep uh, seller I'm breaking down on me right when we go to back into where we're going to be selling this product at we know we need to be selling it or we need to be expecting and anticipating to be selling this product at about 51 53 49 ish as opposed to the 59 that the current market suggests right so again put more emphasis, we want to be really valuing the historical market, specifically like the 90-day buy box, the 180-day buy box that we saw on this particular um, screen, way more than any kind of glitch or temporary market that may be inflated based on a specific point in time, right? So keep that in mind as we're continuing to work through our Amazon careers. And this is another good one to use, right? But this is also an important one, right? Because when we look at this, you know, um, three-month period, price is pretty stable, right? We see the buy box going between, call it 190, right? So, in an or and ordinarily, we'd be looking to price somewhere between that 90 and 100. That's where the price is going to come in to make sure we kind of extrapolate all of those price points. But also, look what's happened in the past couple of weeks. And you, would, you don't really see it yet in the particular price point reflection. However, I anticipate we likely would. Now, if we look at simply these 30 days, 90 days, excuse me, we see a pretty consistent price point, right, between 90 and 100, right? We go to the buy box statistics, and we will likely see that within the data. But, yep, see 95, 96, right? Exactly what we expected, 90 to 100. And if we just use the buy box rotation, it validates that. However, when we go back to what we were talking about with the velocity and, and how offer counts are a huge indicator of future price point activity, what do we actually see that's going on in the past couple weeks? Well, the offer count started at 16, then it went to 24, 25, 30, 30, 35, 36, up to 40. Right? The offer count has been consistently rising over the past two or three weeks. And so what happens at that point? Right? More offer count more sellers in the pot, more repricers were pricing against each other. Eventually, with enough sellers, with enough market kind of uh, saturation, buy box is going to come down. And now in this case scenario, it hasn't necessarily started to reflect in the market yet, but it will. Right? We went from 15 to uh, almost 50, right? 42 sellers. That's almost a 2 or 3x. And so eventually, something like this will result in a lower price point that we're going to be able to sell at. And so something to keep in mind, of course, we want to understand the historical market, but we really want to understand the micro offer trend. And so the offer trend of the past two or three weeks is, is significantly increasing. And so this is something that we'd like to be skipping on, right? Because we can't expect the same 90 to 100 price point, right? Ordinarily, we, you know, back into like our, what, call it $50 buy cost, something like that, which is good, awesome, fantastic. However, using what we now know, we, we know that it's likely that this current market won't last. And so we'd probably be looking at like an $80 market or like a $75 market. We don't know how drop how much is going to drop, but we can rest assured that it likely will drop based on the current trend of the offer count. And so always have your kind of spidey senses up. Always be cautious of markets where you see this increasing offer count because likely that usually results in a decrease, a decreasing, a, a, a worse buy box in the future, right? So keep that in mind. Similar story here, right? We see a specific market between March 16th and September, right? Price point was 100, you know, 80. I mean, pretty stable though, relatively stable offer count, right? Offer count sneaks back up to 96. So that's relatively stable. However, what's happened in the past month or so? Right, if we look at three months, you know, it was trending between six and ten, eight and whatever, you know, oscillating up and down, but then five to twelve to sixteen to seventeen to fifteen to sixteen. Right? This action right here is gonna result in and it already has a decreased price point. Right? This is kind of what we were talking about before, but it's already happened. Right? We were at eighty two, eighty five, you know, seventy five, up at a hundred. We had a particular market for a while, right? All the way from like April to September, but as soon as those offers started to rise, the price dropped. Right? And look at how quickly it actually happened. Right here we're sitting at a hundred dollar price point and five sellers. 
and fast forward a couple weeks, we're at sixteen sellers and sixty dollars. That's almost a fifty percent decrease just by increasing, you know, the sellers, you know, almost you know two x. And so this is the sort of activity that I was kind of trying to warn you guys after the last of the last market is we really, really, really have to be cognizant and cautious of any markets where the offer count is rising, right? That's going to be a huge red flag for the f future of any particular product. Keep this in mind. Offer count, offer count, offer count. We talked about it before. Offer count is going to really dictate where velocity is happening, right? Where we could sell some units and where we cannot. Offer count is also going to be a huge under or dictator of where a particular price point can p potentially drop in the future and where it, will, where it won't. Same thing here, right? Offer count one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, up to 11, and we already see the price point, 70, 65, now it's down to 47. So those are the sorts of things when we talk about that last profitability piece is understanding what, uh, what, what effect offer count, micro offer count trend has on the future buy box activity and also, right, conversely, what a stable offer trend has on future buy box activity. And so when we talk about, you know, kind of wrapping up here, how this whole cow keeper helps us make accurate sourcing decisions, it helps us avoid bad buys, right, with understanding where buy box isn't being show or shared, where the brand is on the listing, where we can under where we can receive an IP complaint. From a velocity perspective moving forward, where we can claim some sales, where we aren't eligible to claim some sales, where products are moving, where they're not, where the buy box is being shared by Amazon, where they're not. And then finally, the third point of the, of the puzzle, profitability. Where that profit's going to be stable based on the offer count, where that profit's potentially going to uh, get hit moving forward, right? Drop moving forward based on the offer count and kind of where are the, all the other listings fall in between, right? And so that's going to be it for today's video. Hope you did enjoy it. If you did, um, drop a like, subscribe to the channel. A lot more content like this to come moving forward as we continue to work through Q4 and work into 2025. So stay tuned and make sure you follow along the journey.